Hello and welcome to lecture number 20. We're going to start moving into talking about different types of psychedelic drugs. Uh, in this particular lecture, we're going to talk about um, scopolamine, uh, mescaline, and methylene deoxymethamphetamine, or ecstasy. We'll talk about a few others uh, along the way as well, as, such as some synthetic amphetamines. In the second part of this lecture, that would be lecture number 21, uh, we'll take a look at uh, other drugs such as ketamine and also some potential therapeutic uses for some of these drugs. So we'll get to that in the next lecture. So we'll start here about some categories of psychedelic drugs. Uh, talk about scopolamine, mescaline, uh, and methylene deoxymethamphetamine, which is ecstasy. Then in the next lecture, we'll talk about hallucinogens such as LSD and psilocybin. Um, ketamine, PCP, and dextromethorphan, and then finally talk about some treatment potential of uh, psychedelic drugs. But that'll be in the next lecture. So let's start with uh, these categories of psychedelic drugs. The first category are ones that are anticholinergic, such as scopolamine. The catecholaminergic uh, include mescaline and MDMA. The serotonergic include uh, LSD and psilocybin. And then the glutaminergic NMDA receptor antagonists, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, include two psychedelic anesthetics, PCP and ketamine, and also the drug dextromethorphan. So let's start with scopolamine. This is a prototype anticholinergic psychedelic. It is a competitive antagonist of the muscarnic type of acetylcholine receptor. This is a deliriant and an antioxidant. It's also amnestic. Uh, in fact, um, anesthesiologists often give scopolamine uh, with the specific goal of reducing uh, memory uh, during a procedure. Uh, this is also associated with mild euphoria, fatigue, and loss of attention. This particular drug clouds rather than expands consciousness. And the idea oftentimes with people who take hallucinogenic drugs is an attempt to expand their consciousness. And that's the whole idea behind LSD, or at least... Um, medically, scopolamine can be found in some travel sickness products and patches, so use with those uh, should be uh, cautious. Certainly, you want to uh, be cautious with that sort of um, drug. So some common anticholinergics include scopolamine, atramine, atropine, sorry, and L-hyosiamine. Uh, atropine is uh, the drug often used to dilate your eyes um, when uh, you go to the eye doctor or atropine derivatives. Atropine is also used to treat uh, pesticide exposure and uh, nerve gas exposure. And so the uh, atropine is there uh, to uh, block that acetylcholine at the muscarnic receptors because if you remember those pesticides and nerve gases um, are uh, permanent and irreversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And so by blocking those muscarnic type acetylcholine receptors, it blocks the effects of those uh, compounds. So some historical background and some common elements. Um, these drugs have been associated with sorcery, magic, witchcraft, and aphrodisiacs. Um, some people report the sensation of flying, which is why they've been associated with um, sorcery. Uh, these compounds are found in a number of different um, plants, and some of these you'll recognize as some that have been associated with witchcraft. Um, not potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, or peppers, but these are all uh, nightshades. And so when we get to deadly nightshade, we'll talk about that. Uh, the mandrake root, or mandragoum, or mandragora, uh, has obviously been associated with magic and is mentioned in the Harry Potter series. Uh, deadly nightshades, uh, and this is Atropa belladonna. Um, has uh, been associated with this as well. Interesting historical note in the 1920s, uh, women would put uh, belladonna in their eyes to dilate them because pupil dilation is a social cue indicating that you're attracted to someone. Enbane uh, and Daytura or, and also gypsum weed uh, have been associated with uh, witchcraft as well. The effects include increased heart rate, uh, dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, drowsiness, and amnesia. And the amnesia is, of course, something we want to be cautious about uh, from the perspective of taking medication. Toxicity can include delirium, mental confusion, 
increased body temperature, nausea, vomiting, fixed and dilated pupils, uh, and hallucinations. Most deaths from these types of drugs uh, are due to accidents or homicide or suicide, uh, not from an overdose in and of itself. Uh, so caution is obviously uh, warranted um, because you can um, be mentally confused and do things you wouldn't do otherwise. Mescaline is the next drug we're going to talk about. It's from the peyote cactus, shown here on the right, uh, which is found in Mexico in the southwestern United States. It is legalized as part of a sacrament of the Native American church. You must be a member of the Native American church and performing uh, the rituals associated with peyote. Uh, these are often vision quest drugs. The pharmacological effects of uh, mescaline if they're chewed, uh, those buttons that you see there are chewed. Uh, onset is in about 30 to 90 minutes. Uh, duration is about 10 hours and is excreted uh, unchanged. So uh, we talked in previous lectures about how uh, in certain cultures, uh, urine is drank with uh, to prolong the effects of these uh, types of drugs. Um, so this is often um, associated with uh, various hallucinations. Uh, and is also associated with, um, like I said, vision quests as part of the um, sacrament of the Native American Church. Uh, the most commonly used and abused drug uh, we'll talk about in uh, psychedelics is MDMA or ecstasy. And this drug was legal until the 1990s in the United States. You can often find it at bars, um, drug stores, etc. Um, so this is known as ecstasy or molly. It's metabolized into MDA, um, but is less hallucinogenic with less extreme visual distortions and disembodiment. It can be associated with severe toxicities. Uh, generally, um, most deaths associated with MDMA are due to either the hyperthermia or to um, water intoxication, because one of the things that MDMA does is it uh, has an effect on the thirst satiety system, making users believe that they are constantly thirsty. And so they keep drinking water and drinking water and drinking water until they flushed out all the electrolytes in their system. And as a result, they have cardiac arrest. And so it's really that water intoxication that results in deaths associated with this particular drug. There are central nervous system side effects, depersonalization, which is probably one of the reasons why it's used, uh, can induce paranoia and anxiety, um, suicidal ideation. The biggest effects are that disruption of homeostasis, including hyperthermia and reduced thirst sati satiety. So what happens is because of disruptions in homeostasis, the body has a hard time regulating its, um, its body temperature. And as a result, the, uh, all of the heat is uh, expressed um, through the skin and via sweat. And this is one of the reasons why uh, raves and uh, places associated with uh, ecstasy use are often very hot because everyone there is, their bodies are, are basically they're all running a fever. Um, and that hyperthermia can be dangerous, but that reduced thirst satiety and drinking too much water is part of this. Because it has a pretty intense euphoric high, it promotes continued use. This is, uh, has, has been, in the past, a very popular club drug. Again, as we've talked in previous lectures, sort of drugs become more and less popular uh, depending on uh, the sort of zeitgeist. So the pharmacokinetics of ecstasy, it's metabolized into MDA, which is an active metabolite. Uh, so time to peak plasma concentration of MDMA is about two hours. It's about six and a half hours for the active metabolite of MDA. So there's sort of essentially two peaks that occur associated with this drug. So the first component, MDMA, has an elimina uh, elimination half-life of around nine hours. Um, and for MDA, about 25 hours. So um, it's going to be six days before that uh, all of that metabolite has left your system. So uh, here we can see uh, participants were... Um, provided with MDMA. You can see here at the top, time to maximal plasma distribution is about 2.3 hours. And the average plasma elimination half-life was nine hours, sort of give or take two hours. If we go down here to that main metabolite, six and a half hours, give or take a couple hours, 
uh, until that peaks, and uh, about 25 hours, give or take, really 14 hours. Um, so anywhere from 10 to 38 hours could be the metabolic half-life, depending on the individual. So you can see these um, peak concentrations have various points in this timeline. So one of the issues uh, here are the pharmacokinetics of repeated doses. Uh, MDMA causes metabolic inhibition for about 24 hours. And so additional doses will have a larger peak plasma concentration. And so uh, you have to be cautious if you're going to um, take another um, hit of ecstasy after, you know, say, let's say you're 10 hours into your night and you want to take another, that second one's going to hit you a lot harder and it's going to be a much higher, uh, much longer time before uh, you come down. So uh, ecstasy affects both 5-HT and norepinephrine um, neurons. It's a potent and selective serotonin neurotoxin in animals uh, because it causes damage to the serotonin transporter. As a result, you can get elevated serotonin. Uh, symptoms of uh, use of this drug include teeth grinding, muscle tension, um, nausea, depression, anxiety, mental confusion. Uh, one of the things that happens is over time you get more tolerant to the positive effects than the negative effects. And so this is often why people kind of grow out of the use of this drug, uh, because they're not getting um, the good parts out of it, all they're getting are the bad parts. The big question about MDMA is whether or not it produces persistent cognitive deficits in humans. We do see there can be some toxic uh, reactions during periods of intense activity because of that hyperthermia, because of potential dehydration. Um, uh, these kinds of um, reactions are potentially severe. Again, most – this is a drug that people don't overdose on um, very often. It's a drug that most, most often uh, causes death through its side effects. So um, this is something I would not particularly recommend. Um, it's what's called candy flipping. Uh, it's ecstasy and LSD. Uh, that's going to be a long – long trip, um, which produces synergistic effects in rodents. LSD has a much greater effect on serotonin. MDMA has a much greater effect on um, norepinephrine along with serotonin and the different serotonin receptors. Um, so be cautious. We do know that striatal serotonin is depleted in brains of heavy chronic MDMA users. Um, these are people who had about 300 pills over the previous six years. Uh, so that's sort of weekly heavy use. 5-HT uh, and 5-HIAA uh, were severely depleted by about 50 to 80 uh, percent. Dopamine levels were unaffected. These behavioral effects um, are probably caused by a massive release and then depletion of brain serotonin. Uh, in fact, uh, my uh, friends that used to rave a lot, I used to work in the club business, and so I know a lot of people have taken this drug. Um, talked about Suicide Tuesday. So they go out and party on Saturday night, and Tuesday everyone just feels like death because um, the ecstasy is worn off. They are completely depleted of serotonin, and as a result, <clears throat> they're feeling pretty crappy. And so just be mindful, be safe, uh, be smart is all I'm saying. Um, so that's ecstasy. We're going to talk about its use in treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in the next lecture, so stay tuned for that. Um, there are other synthetic, synthetic amphetamine deriv derivatives. These tend to be related to both mescaline and amphetamine and produce similar effects. These include MDMA, um, MDE, TMA. These produce uh, – their behavioral stimulants that at higher doses become more like LSD. Uh, these tend to be more toxic and more potent than mescaline. Uh, and that – uh, alteration of the mescaline molecule produces a family of drugs that are similar to amphetamine but also tend to be more potent and toxic. So remember MDMA is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. So this is a variant of methamphetamine um, that you're taking and so keep that in mind. So um, other types of these sort of designer psychedelics include uh, DOM, uh, which is more potent than mescaline but not quite like LSD. Uh, MDA, DMA, MDE, TMA are designer psychedelics. These are all sort of variants of MDMA with actions similar to MDMA. Um, and one of the issues, of course, with street drugs is you don't know what you're getting all the time. So oftentimes there'll be 
um, sort of polluted with these other um, psychedelics. All right, that's the first part of our lecture on psychedelics. We'll return next time to talk about LSD, PCP, and ketamine, and potential therapeutic uses of psychedelic drugs.